Well, welcome everyone. You happy for me to take over, Nick, or did you have something else you wanted to say? <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Um, so a big welcome to everyone. Um, hats off to you for making it to this very late session after what's been a huge day. Um, we weren't expecting a lot of people, I have to say, in New South Wales here. We're already clocked off for the afternoon. So um, you've done well to make it here. And so I really also want to just take a moment to say a really big thank you to Michelle and um, Rhiannon and every one of the you know, Nina crew who have just done a wonderful job at putting together this great conference. And also a big thank you to Nick who stepped in last minute to help um, convene the session. So my name is Min Sito and um, I lead a small non-for-profit social enterprise called Alliance Social Enterprises. And we were formed by an alliance of three community housing providers, regional community housing providers. And we partnered with an organisation in the UK um, called Symmetrica Jacobs to develop uh, an online tool called the Australian Social Value Bank. And it basically allows anyone to rapidly calculate the social value of their programs. Um, but before we kick off officially, I'd like to ask you to take a moment to join me in acknowledging the traditional custodians of the many different lands that we're all dialing in from today. Um, you can do so in the chat if you'd like to. Um, I'm joining from Annawan country in Armadale, New South Wales, the Northern Tablelands. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and welcome any First Nations people that might be joining us in the session as well. Now, before I start, I'd just like to make the disclaimer that I am not an academic, <laughs> nor an economist or an econometrician. In fact, um, my, the majority of my working career I've spent in um, both the delivery and management of social services, uh, primarily supporting disengaged young people with a history of trauma and social disadvantage and everything that accompanies that, like mental health issues, drug and alcohol dependence, homelessness, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I come to this wellbeing economy space having worked with many Australians, including First Nations um, people, who would likely rate themselves subjectively as having a low level of wellbeing. And when you're managing, um, programs kind of you know in the, the welfare space you get sucked into this really strange land of government funding and so I've also seen a lot of taxpayers money wasted I guess um, where it's made little difference to people's lives and I've seen a lot of decisions being made on a whim or gut feeling um, and a lot of resources go to projects where no one really has any clue as to whether it's improving people's well-being let alone providing value for money. Um, and for those of you, I guess, who have been in this space for a while, or maybe even been tuning in during um, the earlier part of the, the Wellbeing Economy Week, you would know that valuation or monetization of social and ecological value is a highly controversial topic. There are lots of people who tend to feel quite passionately against it, which I totally get. Um, but I guess I'm a very pragmatic person and I want people, um, I want to get people making better decisions on the ground now within our current system to direct resources to where they can have the biggest impact on people's well-being. Um, where the well-being of both people and planet are central to our decision making. Don't get me wrong, I understand that the economic system is fundamentally flawed and desperately needs to change. But failing total collapse of the current system, um, which I think is what's going to be needed for transformation, I believe that we can use methodologies like wellbeing valuation to at least start getting the things that people value, like social connections, connection to nature, good mental and physical health, those sorts of things into our decision making. So literally billions of dollars of public money are spent year after year to provide social services, often with a little idea as to whether programs are making a difference, uh, let alone whether they provide good social value for money. Now, 
not only in this sort of well-being economy space, but also within the social sector. I, I get a lot of pushback <laughs> when I talk about programs being cost effective or monetizing social impact. And again, I totally understand the resistance. But the reality is that government has finite resources and infinite demands. And decisions are always going to need to be made about which initiatives we direct our resources to. But I believe that wellbeing valuation has a place in supporting better decision making, decision making that incorporates people's wellbeing into the equation. So, how does government make decisions about where to direct resources? I mean, if we're talking about mines, fossil fuels and the environment, many would say it's purely political. Um, staying in power, it's about staying in power, winning seats, you know, port bar barreling, um, lobbyists with the deepest pockets. But let's say there's a proposal to build some new infrastructure, let's say a road or a hospital. How does government attempt to make an informed decision about whether to go ahead with the development? Generally speaking, a business case needs to be presented, which includes an economic appraisal, also known as a social cost benefit analysis. Now, as the name suggests, social cost benefit analysis weighs up the total social costs against the total social benefits and aims to summarize into a single number, the combined benefits and costs to all members of society. Now, it's really important to realize that Social cost benefit analysis, whether they include a social or not, because often it's just called cost benefit analysis, it includes both the social and the environmental costs and benefits, along with the economic, when considering the overall impact on society. Similarly, when we talk about social value or social impact, the social refers to all of society, not the type of impact. So even though this decision-making has not necessarily been done well, and we've still come up with some really perverse um, outcomes, it's really important because it means that we actually have the structure in place to get the important things considered. We just need to get better at monetizing the social and environmental impacts so that they can be included in the equation. Now, the reason governments and decision makers love cost benefit analysis is that it provides a clear decision rule as to whether a project is overall a benefit to society, um, that is that the total social benefits are greater than the total social costs. It's generally considered that if the net present value is greater than zero or the benefit to cost ratio is greater than one, then the project is worth pursuing. So it can be used for forecasting. So you can do it before you've actually run a project, as in the case of, you know, when you're building a business case around a proposal, or um, when you're reporting after the fact, when you've run a project or you've built a, a road, um, what benefits were actually created. Now, reporting isn't so important when it comes to infrastructure because obviously you're not going to demolish a new tunnel that's been built if it doesn't deliver the benefits you forecasted. But if it comes to evaluating a welfare program, it may inform whether to continue to deliver it. It's arguably even more important to make the most effective use of resources when it comes to improving people's wellbeing. So, um, you know, this methodology is used by governments across um, the OECD. Uh, it's still considered best practice and gold standard. We have a bit of a um, strange history with cost benefit analysis in Australia um, about whether it's a requirement or not, depending on who's in power. Um, but if you go, for example, to uh, the New Zealand Treasury website, um, they state that they encourage all important public sector decisions to be informed by cost benefit analysis to compare different options. So it's still very much um, the methodology that's used by government today. So when we're looking at comparing these sorry, that was Siri had saying hello, uh, whether we need to compare costs to benefits, um, they need to be in the same unit. Yeah? And that's why we need to monetize social outcomes because all our costs are in dollar terms. And so that's why we want our social outcomes in dollar terms. Now, um, monetizing social outcomes or non-market goods as um, economists refer to them as, um, it 
is really difficult, as we know, to do it well. It can also be really costly. And so as a result, what happens is the social outcomes are often sort of left as a qualitative addendum um, in any um, sort of assessment to, to be considered sort of after the fact um, and not included in the equation. There are a number of existing methodologies um, that uh, are accepted by governments um, for monetizing non-market goods. And most governments actually um, you know, produce their own cost benefit analysis guidance um, of you know, how they want you to apply the methodology. And so a number of these methodologies include um, revealed preference, which you know, very um, basically is around using the market, the market's behavior to estimate value. Um, the other is stated preference. And this is probably the methodology that most people are familiar with, where um, they are surveys of people asking what they'd be willing to pay or willing to accept um, for a negative outcome. And um, there are a number, I guess, of um, possible psychological biases that can come into play in how those surveys are designed and administered. And, you know, because it is such a sort of intangible kind of concept, it's really quite difficult for people to come up with a figure in many cases. So, you know, if you ask how much would you be willing to pay um, to overcome, say, depression or anxiety, it's really hard to kind of come up with, well, what's a reasonable figure? And so, you know, you would tend to be guided within um, surveys, well, would it be worth $100? Or would it be worth 1000 Or, you know, so you can be steered in, into, you know, what um, sort of result um, comes out at the end. Um, another methodology that's accepted by government is um, benefit transfers. And that's basically where you refer to someone else's study where they've done the valuation and you refer to that in your assessment. And obviously that's only as good as, um, as the original study, the level of rigor that was in the original study and how closely that aligns to um, the program or project that you're delivering. So they've been the um, methodologies that have been around for quite some time and have been accepted by governments and they all have their own strengths and weaknesses um, and basically, you know, you, you have to try and come up with the highest level of rigour that, um, that you can with the money and resources that you have and so sometimes they're the best approach. But what I want to talk to you about today is wellbeing valuation. And um, I really can't do that without mentioning um, Daniel Fujiwara. Um, he previously, I guess, was head of cost benefit analysis at the Department of Work and Pensions in the UK and has held um, you know, a number of senior economist positions, um, cabinet office, Ministry of Defence, Ministry of Finance in Tanzania. Um, he's also held research positions with um, the United Nations. He then founded um, this uh, organisation called Symmetrica that um, recently joined with Jacobs. So now they're Symmetrica Jacobs. Um, and he has been, him and his team have been advising governments around the world, including um, New Zealand and Canada, um, as they started to apply um, wellbeing valuation as part of their wellbeing budgets. Um, He's worked a lot in, um, you know, helping governments to write their guidance um, and policies around um, wellbeing and wellbeing valuation. He's also worked with the OECD and the World Health Organization. So he really has sort of been at the leading edge of this wellbeing valuation space. And so Daniel and his team at Symmetrica Jacobs, they've provided all of the te technical expertise behind um, the Australian Social Value Bank. So before we start really understanding wellbeing valuation, we need to have a basic concept of what wellbeing is. And I'm sure there are probably people in the audience that have a better understanding of this than me. Um, but as with most things in this space, there's no consensus on a definition of wellbeing, um, even though the concept of wellbeing and happiness is universally accepted you know, across um, cultures. So um, we'll just refer to the um, ONS definition, so the Office of National Statistics in the UK, their definition of well-being is well-being put simply is about how we're doing as individuals, communities and as a nation and how sustainable this is for the future. 
So I guess what we do know about well-being is that it encompasses a number of key dimensions, which are common across countries, um, but they all have, you know, cultural nuances depending on where you live. And that sort of brings us to um, a lot of these indexes. So if we just refer um, first off to the OECD Better Life Index, um, you know, they did a lot of research and were trying to look at, well, again, what are some better indicators than GDP about how countries are faring? And they came up with these um, key dimensions. So income and wealth, work and job quality, housing, health, knowledge and skills, environment quality, subjective well-being, safety, work-life balance, social connections, and civil engagement. And so, um, you know, they're the 11 topics that the OECD has identified as essential in the areas of material living conditions and quality of life. And so they have been, um, you know, rating countries on this index um, for quite some time. And, um, and you know, so this is a, a framework that sits across all countries. Um, and those of you who are familiar with Andy and Mike and the team, um, you know, they've developed this um, Australian National Development Index that has tried to be specific around how we're doing as people and communities and as a nation in Australia. And I guess I just really want to highlight that in both of these indexes, um, subjective well-being is, you know, one of the indicators that really um, contributes to overall well-being of, um, of countries. And so if we look at subjective well-being, um, generally it's conceptualized as consisting of two major components. So the emotional or the affective component and the evaluative or cognitive component. And so um, when we look at effective appraisal of both happiness and anxiety, so if you look at um, you know, a lot of the measures that are being used, they'll generally, you know, for example, I think the UK government, they um, look at um, how happy were you yesterday, I think is the question, and they also um, do another measure around anxiety. It's really important to understand that this effective appraisal um, moves really rapidly and it's impacted by time. So if you think about yourself, you know, if you think about, say, today, even, you know, there may be moments where you were really happy, um, and, you know, something that made you smile, you felt really good about, you had a win, um, and at the same time, you know, there could also have been something negative, I don't know, got cut off in traffic or something um, that will make you feel, um, you know, the opposite of happy, I guess. <laughs> so, um, you know, that it's, it's important to understand that that moves really quickly and, um, and it changes, it's, it's very quick to change and can change throughout the day. It's not like a, a longer term um, measure. Whereas the cognitive appraisal of life satisfaction, it moves much more slowly and is longer lasting. So it's affected um, by things like our employment and our health and our relationships and how we think we're doing in, in comparison to others. Yeah. Now, subjective well-being is a um, validated measure. Um, uh, it's been found to be a um, reliable measure of life satisfaction. Um, and so the um, life satisfaction question has been included in surveys all over the world. So this is the question. Um, it's, it's generally thought of as a subjective well-being measure. And I actually just want you all to... Um, Take a moment and rate yourself on this scale. So the question is overall, how satisfied are you with your life? With 10 being completely satisfied and zero being completely dissatisfied, I want you to just think for a moment where you would rate yourself on this scale. Now, if you're feeling really brave, <laughs> you can pop that number in the chat if you're happy to share and, and let us know how well you think um, or how satisfied you are with your life. Oh, we've got some brave people coming. Wow. Penelope, we've got an eight. And Michelle, we've got a six. Okay. Anyone else brave enough? Maybe not. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so according to the OECD, Australians, oh, we've got a seven to eight from Jenna. Thanks, Jenna. So according to the OECD, Australians on average rate their life satisfaction at 7.3 right, which is higher than the OECD average of 6.5. 
But I think it's really interesting when we start, oh, we've got a six from Loretta. Thanks, Loretta. Um, I think it's really interesting when um, you, they now on the uh, Better Life um, website let you actually go by region and start to break down um, how you're travelling in different indicators by region. And so um, for those of you who are joining us from Queensland, the average life satisfaction in Queensland is a, a whopping 8.1%. Um, in New South Wales and Western Australia, it dips down a bit to 7.8. Uh, Victoria and South Australia beating Queensland, not that I'm wanting to set up any competition between the different states, but um, they sit at 8.5. Uh, our lowest um, state or territory is actually the Northern Territory, whose average life satisfaction is a 7. And our highest would you believe, well, yes, most people would believe this, is actually Tasmania at a huge 9.6. So, um, you know, I think maybe we should all head down to Tassie so that we can all have an improved wellbeing. Uh, great to see. We've got Tassie is my favourite. Uh, fantastic. So, yes, um, I guess really this is just about the fact that this measure, the subjective wellbeing measure, it's used across the globe, it's considered a reliable measure, and um, as such has been included in a whole range of survey data, your general social surveys across different countries, um, all use this measure. And in fact, we have lots of um, our surveys in Australia that also include this subjective wellbeing measure. So now I want to talk to you a little bit about wellbeing valuation and what it actually is and what we're doing. So um, the value of an outcome actually equals the amount of money that induces the equivalent change in wellbeing for the individual. So what we do is um, we get large data sets that exist. Yeah, basically, we can do well-being valuation on any data set that has the subjective well-being measure that we've just talked about, um, a range of demographic um, data and income. And they're the things that we need, as well as whatever the actual outcome is that we're trying to value. We need information about that. And so what we do is um, basically in the data set, this approach is called a quasi-experimental um, approach. So if we're looking at um, trying to actually measure impact, the, the kind of the gold standard is to do a randomised control trial, yeah? So you'd all be familiar with those. Um, we do a lot of drug trials where we're actually trying to see, well, what's the impact of the intervention? So in wellbeing valuation, we don't do that. Um, we, we do that within the data. So we basically um, form two statistically identical groups um, with the only difference being the actual outcome that we're looking at measuring. So for example, we look at um, say a group who in their survey, they've identified that currently they're homeless. And then we look at um, a group that is statistically identical, except when they selected what their current housing situation was, perhaps they said they were in social housing. And then we look at the difference in subjective well-being between those two groups. And realistically, it will be quite small, but for argument, for ease in, in the explanation, we'll say that that's one point on that well-being scale. We then look at how much income does it take to um, improve someone one point on that subjective well-being scale. And that's how we get the, um, the dollar value of that particular outcome. So really what that, that is doing is it's, it's um, putting that improvement in well-being in terms that people instantly um, understand, comprehend, um, recognise. Um, you know, if you say, well, it's a, a 0.23 increase in subjective well-being, conceptually we can get that and we could use that as a scale, but it doesn't have that same um, instant um, you know, understanding that we all share, um, having grown up in culture with money, um, you know, we all have a, a sort of in, innate understanding, I guess, of the value of money. Now, um, for the Australian Social Value Bank, the two data sets that we've used are um, the HILDA survey, which is the Household Income and Labour Dynamics in Australia survey. So that is, um, you know, nationally representative um, of all Australians and um, the Journeys Home Survey, which is people who are homeless or at risk of homelessness, so a much more um, disadvantaged group of people. So we've conducted um, wellbeing valuation on those two surveys to develop our bank of values in the ASVB. Um, I think it's really important to know that um, 
the actual um, wellbeing valuation, the methodology is really best used for changes that occur over time. So rather than one-off events, and that's really comes down to, you know, that overall life satisfaction that, that really only changes sort of over time, um, like how we were saying, compared to, um, you know, the effective um, wellbeing where um, happiness and um, anxiety, et cetera, um, are very rapidly moving, um, overall life satisfaction is, is slower to move. And so therefore, wellbeing valuation is really only relevant to those types of outcomes. So, um, like I said, there are always strengths and weaknesses to um, all monetization approaches. Um, some of the strengths of wellbeing valuation is that it's actually a really cost effective approach uh, because we've got these existing data sets already. Um, the other thing is, is that all outcomes uh, relate to um, well-being as being the main indicator. So it doesn't matter whether you're talking about employment outcomes, health outcomes, um, you know, whatever type of outcome, we, we're relating that back to um, well-being as the, the primary indicator. Um, another um, strength of this approach is that it encapsulated it encapsulates sorry all of the positive and negative outcomes associated with the change so um you know if we think about a housing outcome um you know obviously someone who moved from being homeless to being housed they're going to feel things like an uh, increased sense of personal safety increased sense of self-esteem possibly um you know increased sense of connection um you know a whole range of positive things there's also going to be some people that experience some negative outcomes they might feel stress about having to pay rent and having to you know manage their money um, it, they might feel a sense of you know being closed in or disconnected even from um, people or place um, so this methodology actually averages all of that out so it's a really conservative um, estimation the other thing is it's actually based on the actual experiences of Australians. So unlike those other methodologies where, you know, with stated preference, people are asked to imagine what something would be worth to them. This really just looks at what is the actual experience of an Australian. So, you know, we've looked at the people who are homeless. We've looked at the people who, you know, have been housed in social housing. We looked at the unemployed and people unemployed, not asking people to imagine what that state might be um, like for them. So that's a real strength. And, um, and of course, because we base that on Australian Data. The other real strength is um, having a consistent valuation methodology actually allows you to compare the, um, uh, the social value, I guess, of different outcomes across different policy areas. So if we are looking at, um, you know, the value of, say, housing people compared to, um, you know, uh, education, for example, we're actually able to compare different outcomes across those policy areas because we've got that consistent indicator of well-being um, and the, the valuation methodology is consistent. So it does allow you to compare, which we've never really been able to do before. So this is our current list of um, social values that we have pre-populated in the ASVB online value calculator. Um, they cover all areas of Australian life. Um, they're the largest and most rigorous set of values that currently exist in Australia. Um, but I think one of the things that's really interesting is how it allows you to um, kind of look at the relative value of different outcomes. So for example, if we, let's, let's throw this open to the audience again, um, during COVID, uh, you know, we know that being disconnected from our friends and family was really, really tough on people, particularly um, those down in Melbourne who were in lockdown for such a long time. Um, but, if we were to think, well, what is the value, say, of meeting your friends at least once a week or more for a person over a year, what do we think that would be worth? Like, it's a really hard thing to imagine, isn't it? Does anyone want to have a guess what they think that that might be worth? It's, it's a, a very abstract idea. And I guess that's, that's the point really is, you know, um, when we use those other methodologies, it's really hard to think about what that might be worth. But if we look at well-being valuation, um, that the value of that, of meeting friends at least once a week or, or more, 
um, for one person over a year is worth around five and a half thousand dollars. Um, if we look at feeling in control of life, so I've just picked, you know, a couple of things around COVID, I guess, you know, lots of people felt that um, they, they didn't have control over their life. They couldn't decide what they wanted to do when they wanted to do that kind of thing. But if we look at this idea of feeling in control of life, it's worth nearly $10,000. And then the value of having an increased sense of personal safety, um, so having moved from not feeling safe to having an increased sense of safety for a 12-month period, it's around $21,000. So even just being able to put a figure, I don't know about you, but, you know, if I, if I think about those ideas in the abstract, I have no idea what that's worth. But having a figure that we can, um, you know, put some context to the value of those different things is really helpful if we're looking at doing things like social cost benefit analysis, you know, when they were trying to make decisions about, um, you know, do we extend the lockdown? Is it worth, you know, the, the extra illness and those kinds of things compared to the impact on people's mental health, you know, being able to add these kinds of um, um, values into those kinds of decisions, um, you know, surely has to be a, a good thing. Um, so New Zealand Treasury were the first organisation to purchase our Bank of Values um, back in 2017, before we'd actually officially launched um, as part of their wellbeing budget. They, um, they purchased a licence to our whole Bank of Values, which we then worked with Symmetrica to convert to the New Zealand context. Um, and so New Zealand Treasury encourages important public sector decisions to be informed by cost benefit analysis. And this helps decision makers to compare the different options. And so they have developed their own, what they call their CBAX um, spreadsheet tool, which really helps people to do um, in-house, I guess, cost benefit analysis. It simplifies it um, so that people can use it. And so, um, for example, they use um, our wellbeing values when they're doing their internal um, uh, budget allocation um, across different departments. And, um, and within their CBAX tool, anyone who is applying for um, money to run different you know, social programs, um, they have to uh, put forward the business case using that CBAX tool and they can um, use you know, our wellbeing values in there as part of that um, cost benefit analysis. And so, um, you know, we've had early dis discussions um, with Mike and the Andy crew um, with the work that they're doing for the WADI, the Western Australian Development Index, which hopefully if you get to tune into the session tomorrow, you'll hear all about. Um, but one of the things that we've, we've talked about doing as part of the proposal is because they will be collecting data against all these indexes anyway, that, um, you know, if we add in the subjective well-being measure and income and, and a range of other demographic data, that we can then use that data set that they're developing to actually value um, those different, you know, improvements in those different indicators so that the Western Australian government would then be able to use them within their um, business case and, and forecasting cost benefit analysis. So um, that's really exciting um, for me personally, you know, to be able to um, base the valuation on the actual um, data that's being collected at that time. So everything aligns perfectly and we know that we're actually valuing it based on um, the population of the people that are um, being surveyed and that it's relevant to. So that's really exciting and I can't wait for that presentation tomorrow. I hope you'll all be able to join that. Um, so now I just really wanted to touch on, um, you know, this idea of making wellbeing valuation accessible to people. Um, I think really we want this social value concept to be in the, in the conversation, on the ground, and using it to inform decisions. So we've developed this um, online social value calculator, which makes social cost benefit analysis simple enough so that any organisation can apply it. Um, it is a proportionate approach, um, but it can be used for business cases, so for forecasting. So if there are, you know, even small social enterprises or not-for-profits and they're seeking funding, they can use the tool to run a social cost benefit analysis and use that as, um, you know, um, part of their um, 
you know, funding applications and tenders and that kind of thing. And of course, it can also be used um, for evaluation and reporting back to government or investors um, who have invested in particular social programs. Um, and one of the use cases we've seen um, in some of the very large community housing providers that we work with um, is that they use that internally for um, budget allocation advocacy. <laughs> so, you know, if um, just thinking of a, a case of one very large um, community housing organization and um, one of the community development team was a really strong advocate of the ASVB and um, he would often run um, statements to put um, forward uh, business cases for, for the, you know, the coup of that organization to try and actually secure more funding because, you know, um, I guess uh, a lot of the, the coups have come from traditional accounting backgrounds and, you know, uh, want to see, well, why should we be spending money on that program when we could be building more houses for people who need them? And so actually being able to have that conversation about the improvement that this makes in the lives of the tenants that they're housing, um, you know, was a really strong argument that they'd never been able to make before that. So, um, like I said, the ASVB, it's a proportionate approach. It's very simple, um, but it's what we would term in, um, I guess, in evaluation circles as rigorous enough. Um, and that's really because of this well-being valuation methodology, um, making sure that those values are of a high level of rigor. Very quickly, just so you know how simple it is um, to use the calculator, we need very limited data. You basically just need to select the outcome um, of the program um, or that the program that you're delivering or going to deliver has achieved from the drop down list. So we've got that currently 66 uh, different values in that list. And um, we need to enter how many people achieve the outcome. Um, generally speaking, you do need some evidence um, as, as to you know, how many people, if you are reporting rather than forecasting, um, or even if you're forecasting some evidence about how you've come up with a number of people who achieve the outcome. So generally we provide surveys that align to the original survey data so people can ask um, their participants in their program the before and after questions and get that evidence. But sometimes when it comes to very sort of binary outcomes like employed or unemployed, um, you know, they can use their program data. Um, they don't need to collect extra data. And then they just need to enter in how much it costs them to deliver the program. And so the value calculator then calculates the net benefits that your program creates to society and produces an impact statement that you can download. Now, if you have the ability to do a bespoke cost benefit analysis or calculation yourself like government, um, you know, then you can certainly use the ASBB wellbeing values within your own calculations. As like I said, they're, you know, the largest, um, most rigorous and comparable set of social values currently available in Australia. So, <clears throat> excuse me, whilst wellbeing valuation is not the answer to fixing this huge mess that we're in, um, it can help in this transition period towards a wellbeing economy to at least ensure that the wellbeing of individuals is being included in the decision making. If you're interested in learning more about wellbeing valuation, um, certainly we have a technical paper that I can send you a copy of, or if you're interested in the ASBB for you know, any projects you're trying to get off the ground, um, please feel free to visit our website or get in touch. That's basically about all I wanted to cover today. So we might open it up for questions if anyone has any or wants to make any comments or wants to disagree with valuing um, or monetizing social outcomes. Happy to hear it. Anyone? Hi again. Oh, we're getting some big echo from you, Nick. Anyone got any questions? No? Well, thank you for those. Oh, I have to run another meeting. Thank you for sharing, though. All good. <laughs> Thanks, Jenna. Bye. Again, Nick here. Is that better? Yeah, that's better, Nick. Thank oh, yeah, I was like, oh, I'm too confused. Um, yeah, I, mean, I absolutely love it. And I just kind of was wondering, is it like a, um, like a margin of error type thing? But, you know, I, I just feel like if I take this to people, they might go, Oh, come on, that's a bit high. But you just kind of like, what's the next 
statement you make after that, I suppose. Like, I, I, I love it. I, I, but yeah. So um, I guess, you know, the, the rigor is really in the, the methodology. So um, we talk to people about the methodology and we certainly are open, um, you know, like I said, with the technical reference paper and that kind of thing. They are all sense checked against um, other values that have been um, derived using other methodologies. Um, so, um, and as well as the fact that there are a range of wellbeing value banks across different countries. And what we do know is that um, for similar type countries, um, then you know the, the wellbeing values generally will be in, in a similar ballpark um, for most things. So you know certainly um, the UK and America um, and Canada, they're, they're all kind of in a, a similar ballpark. We haven't actually done um, wellbeing valuation in um, in any developing countries. Um, and that's sort of an area of research that we really want to pursue, not me, but Symmetrica, um, you know, because obviously they have different um, different values and, and different, um, uh, yeah, different values and, and how they value money and how they, similarly with our Indigenous culture, um, you know, how they value money and across, um, um, they have a, a different sense of, I guess, how that works and how that impacts well-being and what they value in well-being. So they're all areas of research that, um, you know, uh, are still yet to be done in this sort of emerging space. But in terms of um, validity, you know, and, and with any cost-benefit analysis, you generally would do sensitivity analysis where you'd have a upper and lower bound. So you'd run different scenarios um, to kind of give you that threshold, I guess, um, does that kind of answer your question? It does, yeah. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> um, I really like the, well, like, the effective altruism type thing where you kind of go, potentially, like, the most impact you can have per dollar spent is an emerging economy type thing. Um, and, yeah, just thinking, like, indexing it to that or whatever. It doesn't really matter. I'm just kind of thinking through, like, um, yeah, when, you know, $21,000 indexed to the, you know, median household income or personal income or like, but I know that's just for me to work through. Because I, I love it. I'm just kind of like, I love being able to, I, I kind of hate that we have to quantify things in economic value, but like once you realize the benefit of doing that and then being able to use them to make a strong argument for your other impact, it's kind of like once you kind of know that it's almost like this empowerment and enlightenment or like a secret code to kind of get to that. So um, I mean, Absolutely. Like I know there is always that instant resistance in the beginning, but again, I just think it comes back to this is the system we've got at the moment and how do we actually make sure that, you know, the right things are being captured, um, you know, currently in this existing system. Um, not that I agree with it. And, and like I said, I, I think we need to totally start again pretty much, but um, in this interim period, you know, it's about how do we um, get those existing systems to actually start to include Talk in their language meet their <laughs> yeah language. get your yeah get your thing achieved through it achieving their thing as well or something. <laughs> yeah exactly well any other questions oh scotty's just sent through a big long message what, is, what have you got to say scotty did you want to just unmute and ask <laughs> yeah look i think it might have just been answered a bit there but I sort of recognise that it's a really useful and valuable tool to attempt to communicate living values with the, the entities which simply can't think in non-monetary terms, like governments and corporations, and they're, they're quite limited in their intellect, really. As a, if you look at them as a, a person, the corporate person, they're they're not really very good at emotions and things like that. Um, <laughs> Yep. And money has been and it remains like a prime mover of the enclosure or colonisation of every aspect of our lives. And now it's down to the data that we type into our computer and everything like that. So monetization of things that simply aren't relevant to money, like love, community, seems like a bizarre goal. And are we just innovating onto the side of a concept like only money can be valued that needs to be replaced and not really tinkered with? How can we change the story to a healthy one instead of giving the credence to money measurements, toxic tale of greed? 
I absolutely 100% <laughs> agree with you, Scotty, which seems kind of odd considering what I'm saying. But, you know, that, that's where I think we, we actually just need a totally different system, you know, and, and I think, you know, post-capitalism, post-everything. <laughs> um, but again, I, I kind of, I'm very pragmatic and it's like, well, how do we, how do we at least start moving in the right direction now? Um, and yeah, like, like I said, there is a strong resistance against this. I absolutely understand that resistance and I, I empathise with that resistance. Um, but at the same time, I guess I'm coming from a space where, um, like I said, I come from social services. It's this bizarre kind of funding system, um, you know, that you kind of are forced into to just try and help people, <laughs> you know. And, and so um, I guess this is kind of another hoop where actually we're saying, you know, the outcomes that you're kind of funding is not necessarily the important things that people need, you know, this, this thing of how important it is to be connected and be part of community and those things, you know, they're often just dismissed as like, again, you know, this sort of afterthought, this, uh, you know, addendum to the, the actual <laughs> um, decision making. And it's like, well, actually, no, these things are really, really important and they're significant to people. And, and um, those things are part of what impacts the overall well-being for people and you know certainly money is a part of that you know if you can't eat if you can't you know have a roof over your head all those things your well-being is it's not going to be great you know so that's where if we can you know start to actually really um talk about the significance of these other things which aren't normally um captured or valued that um you know it can just i guess slightly help us in this crazy system that we're in that, you know, that we, we need to change desperately. So I'm so, looking at myself before I even say this, but I think there's something, I don't know, you know, money can be converted to time to spend with your family. It can be converted to time to go to the gym to be more healthy. It can be, you know, like it's, it can be converted to, you know, it, it's. But you can also do all those things without money can in some ways um but i i mean that's an, I mean, i'm just i'm not saying that's the, the <laughs> best but there is this kind of like you know uh, subsistence living and stuff uh, i see a lot of like subsistence living in indonesia and stuff and it's just like i don't know yeah bit yeah, of money it's a thing. really tricky one isn't it and i mean i yeah want to reiterate that what you're doing is very okay. important and wasn't actually it's guessing funny. it <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> like, although, it's not perfect, but it's something. Yeah. Tricky thing. <laughs> it is. Yes. Well, on that note, if we don't have any other questions, thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Scotty, for your question. Lovely to e-meet you. <laughs> and thanks, Nick, for your help in chairing the session. Um, and I hope everyone gets to enjoy the rest of the conference and hopefully I'll get to see you in some of the other sessions. Did yeah, you have you. any final words, Nick, that we have to cover or in housekeeping or anything? I uh, just, you can't stay here, but you, no, oh, damn, I didn't mess up. You don't have to go home, but you can't, no. Um, <laughs> no there's no more. I, I think we're starting at 9.30 tomorrow. I should really work that out before I say it. I looked at it earlier. Um, but yeah, it's going on for the next two days, um, hybrid. So also bear with us as we get through the transition to hybrid in four concurrent sessions and stuff too. Um, yeah, there's just such an amazing network of people here that it's it's just a great three days. I think appreciate that, yeah. And hopefully next, next year we'll all be out to meet in person and not have to deal with uh, border closures and those things. So that we can get some real hugs, you know? That's what we need. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I had to step away from my schedule to come up to the thing. But yeah, thank you, Scotty, for so 10 10 a.m. Okay. is the start. Sounds great. We'll see you then. Oh, Scotty's got something else to say. What was that, Scotty? Unmute. Yeah, that's modified for New South Wales time. Ooh, yeah. yeah so probably 9 10 in your schedule. Yeah. What about to you, base, Scotty? Ah, uh, Canberra, Bungendore. Very nice. 
<sighs> all right. Well, on that note, hopefully you all get to see um, the, the session with Mike and, and all the, um, uh, what are they calling that session? But they'll be talking about the Wadi and what some of the different Australian governments are doing towards um, wellbeing budgets and economies, et cetera, et cetera. So that should be a really good session I'm looking forward to. So hopefully I'll see some of you there. Thanks so much. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.